Good evening, hey hey, this is Tiger, welcome to my stream. Hey AJ, nice to see you on the chat, thank you for moderating my stream again. CD Radar, hey, nice to see you, bitte seien Sie achtsam, andere brauchen Ihren Sitzplatz vielleicht notwendiger, is the word. I'm always impressed with your, with your German. I might, I might mention that I started to try to learn some Czech words to be able to read that uh, signaling uh, document, at least to find my way around. But, oh yeah, we will see where this leads us to. <laughs> Before we start, please read the disclaimer and hear the disclaimer. We are talking about playing a computer game here. So please leave the real trains and the real railway installations alone even if we always try to understand the concepts the technical and regulatory concepts um as as, as deeply and as thoroughly as it is possible at least this is what we are striving to uh, but first of all we are trying to enjoy our train game um the best way it can be done so, um, to the trains. What did I want to do today? You can read it in the stream title. I wanted to do something completely different. Uh, go back to the United Kingdom, to the Tees Valley line. I have not played the Tees Valley line on the stream so far. It is one of the British DLCs that is set back in time. It does not really say when it is. Uh, set, but I think it is set sometime in the 80s, mid 80s probably, and we will be driving a service with the famous British Railways class 101 because it is the only train in the game that I think, uh, or at least the one, the only one that I am aware of that has a diesel mechanical transmission. And this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, I want to go into the different sorts of transmission. And before we go to the uh, hydrokinetic transmission that we find on a lot of vehicles, I wanted to just relax and do a nice little stream about the diesel mechanical transmission that we have on this beautiful train, the class 101 built in the mid 50s of the last century with trains that had been in use up to almost 50 years. And um, I want to do uh, a certain service with a three car unit. I think this 40, 50, 1450 service so let's turn on the service too but not jump into the service but on foot in saltburn at the sea i said 1450 did i not so 15 and five minutes earlier so that we can see the train arrive maybe let's put some weather on like April, what we have now, yeah. So, transmissions is what I wanted to talk about today, and then especially the epicyclical transmission that we have on the class 101 that we need to understand to be able to drive it properly. You might remember if you have played this train before, that it has a gear selector and that you need to throttle down when you're changing gears and all that stuff. And why? And why it is like that and, and when you need to throttle down and when you need to wait a bit and at what point you can actually throttle up again. And why it is like that, I wanted to look at that. Um, yeah, and share what I have found out in watching some videos and reading up some sources. So... We're not going too deeply into the technical details. Uh, I couldn't do that. I'm not qualified for that. But at least into the logical concepts of this technology so that we can understand enough to be able to drive it properly. And it is only about the propulsion on this train. I won't talk too much about the vacuum brakes. Again, a manually lapping brake system that we have on this train. On vacuum brakes, I should make a, a different 
separate video. We've already talked about vacuum brakes when we uh, when we drove the British Rail Class 52, the Western, in the West Somerset Railway. And today we're back to vacuum brakes. And I find this class 101 is an extremely well made train but it is not easy to drive it takes a lot of feeling and it sometimes really drives me crazy to get the correct stopping point with this manually lapping vacuum brakes train is approaching we are we are at saltburn at the sea here what is a seaside holiday resort well resort um, in North Yorkshire if I'm not mistaken so the sea is the North Sea and we're not actually seeing a lot of the sea but we are we are driving along the coast until we go along the River Tees that is the namesake for this DLC. So we're hijacking this train here. If you don't want to steal the points that this AI driver uh, has gotten, you have to wait a bit until you take over the seat, otherwise you can really steal points. But I don't want to do that. So the first thing that I do is to adjust the service marker that tells us the destination board that tells us where we are going it always is perfectly aligned if this lever is about in this position pointing to the right that was too much that was too much again now it should be okay let's see if it is okay well yeah that will do we can take the service the guy went away I'm always like to I always like to set up the rear cap first, turn off, lap position, off, neutral, idle, that is good. If you want to turn on the train lights, you can use this magnificent old lever to give people some lights. Then back to the front end. If we keep the doors open and are sitting in our chair when the service starts at 14.50 then the passengers should actually be able to board. Control circuit key is on. The AWS isolation lever is hidden but it can be found underneath the second man seat. Reverse it to forward. Panels. White lights at the front. Destination is already on, then we have to set the destination to Bishop's Auckland. Are they boarding? Yeah, looks quite well. So, Bishop's Auckland, we have white lights at the front. Then I align my cap view in a way that I can see my speed clock my tachometer, my brake dials. I can see to what setting the gear lever is set. And we wanted to have some train lights maybe on the front as well. And also if we have the setting like this we can see where the brake lever is set to. <coughs> At the rear, red lights and also a destination marker. Sometimes if you have double traction, more than one train set, then you might want to set the destination in between as well. So, we release the brakes. Before they release, 
completely gear selected to one and then we can throttle we have a 15 limit when we start here at Saltburn so we will go back with our throttle to idling and then every time we are coasting select gear number four why it is like this why we always need to coast in gear number four not in neutral not in any other gear we will see as soon as we get to the presentation and learn or talk about how this um, this epicyclical gear train is built and the gearbox is built so you might have seen there is a increase to 30 at this point so we can go back to gear number two and increase the speed every time on the tachometer you see that the needle is hitting this up arrow here we throttle down then we can gear up and every time wait until the needle on the tachometer has dropped below this marker here then you can throttle up again so and now I have been speeding because I have been explaining so I have to slow down a bit thirty was the limit here gear selected to four because we are I we are coasting now the limit climbs to forty to be able to accelerate we need to find a proper gear like when we're going 40 I should take gear number three and we can accelerate coasting bit of break again I am too generous with the speed and am speeding <laughs> the amount of brake force that we are applying you can see that on this dial here on the left there you can read the inches of mercury that we have on our vacuum brake what is always a unit that enchants me and saying it inches of mercury preparing for a stop at the next station limit climb to 55 Mars case also a seaside town for slowing down depends on how fast you need to be and how tight your timetable is I found that slowing down with 15 to 10 inches of mercury typically makes sense and then there is a lot of feeling needed to stop this train in a proper way especially when we're running downhill like we're doing here before we stop we need to move the gear lever to the neutral position I personally prefer the new modern trains I can see it but to be honest this train is modeled really really nicely it works what is modeled it sounds great and it runs it runs 
nicely and uh, it is fun finding the correct settings for the brakes. Stopping an electro star in the correct spot is child's play if you compare it to that here. You're sitting in the station, typically 15 minutes of Mercury are enough. Otherwise it takes too long to get started. Yeah, we don't see a lot of the sea in our DLC here. But the sea is just behind the houses here. Behind the church, there is the North Sea. And later we will get into the area where the old British Tayside steel industry was seated for decades, for long decades. And now everything has been demolished. So we can apply throttle quite quickly. And as soon as we get to this point, we can gear up. As soon as the tachometer reaches the up arrow, throttle down gear up and then just wait here again the next stop is quite close so we don't have a lot of distance to get to up to speed and then slow down again so slowing down is a bit of a harsh process here ah. and again 10 yards late well I hope I will get into my controls a bit better during the stream. So, long neck. You can see a lot of rural area. On the left, on the right, there are the towns that connect to the seaside. Good old cold North Sea, the river Elbe that flows through my hometown actually ends there. Oh, that is that is cool, the Elbe. And it is called Labe in, in, in Czech. Yeah, from what you can read on the internet, uh, tourism is not that great anymore on these towns. As it used to be in the good old days. There were tourists on the s at the seaside and there was this s huge steel industry. And now tourists are a bit scarce and the steel industry is no more. I tried to find out when exactly this uh, DLC is set, but I couldn't find out, I did not find any sources from uh, DTG telling us when exactly this uh, DLC is supposed to set, because if you look in the pause screen, we are in 2023, and that is obviously not what people look like here. It should be mid-80s, I think. It can't be later than 1979, because the big blast furnace at Red Car is already there. 
and it was built in 1979 and uh, from what I have read the class 101s did not run longer than up until 1998 so I think we are 1985 or something like this so a time when the steel industry here was run by the British Steel Company and in its full bloom still the houses that you can see there is a red car belongs to red car I think next stop is red car east we're coasting in preparing to stop in the manual they suggest that you always should start slowing down with 15 inches of mercury but then you need to start slowing down quite early if 15 inches of mercury should be enough for the whole stopping process Oh, I heard about station Red Car British Steel that is the least used station in Britain. Nowadays, probably. <laughs> oh. At the time... Oh no. I should not read this, the chat when I'm trying to stop my train. Well, I managed to hit the station at least. And the platform. Yeah, we, we will be stopping at um, Red Car British Steel. I think it was more of a thing in the days that we are set here. Because nowadays, when all the steel industry is down, the station probably does not lead anywhere. I read that most of the installations, some landmark installations like the big blast furnace in Redcar, uh, have not been demolished before November last year. Also, um, um, a basic oxygen steel installation that we will be passing at uh, Middleborough. You can see videos of it being demolished by explosives. But at the time that we are running our trains here, they were still in full bloom and still working and uh, run by British Steel Company. So, no guard is bossing us off. We have to do that ourselves. Red Car Central is next. And then there is Red Car British Steel. I think we're still in a 55 limit, but we won't get to 55 until we have to prepare for stopping again. This nice bell sound from the AWS.
So, I guess we should start slowing down now. Platform. Then we can switch the gearbox to neutral. Now we are a bit late. But that's okay. For that we have a gentle stop and we will make we will make up the time I'm quite sure. Overshot two yards. So Red Car Central can find some nice videos about a red car seaside town and after red car the steel area begins it was more or less run by the British until the 1990s then British steel privatized was merged with uh, a Dutch group, I think, belonging to an Indian steel producer, and those guys mothballed everything at around 2008, 2009, or something. So there was no steel produced anymore around that time. Then, for a couple of years, an outfit from Thailand, a Thai group, do you say Thailand in England? I don't think so. Siam, Thai, a Thai group reopened the works for a couple of years until they finally closed it down. And in 2022, the last remaining installations were destroyed, blown up by explosives. Because making steel here in the UK was no longer possible to compete with the cheaper steel prices on the global market. We might, what we see here in the distance, this structure that looks like a stack with some conveyor baits on the outside is the blast furnace, red car blast furnace. Now it is hidden by the beam in the middle. Now you can see it again. It, at the time it was one of the biggest ones ever built in Europe and the two towers to its left what was the name of that Cowper Cowper stoves I think they make the hot air that is needed for the blast that is sent into the furnace don't know about you but I think a blast furnace is, is really a a name that tells you everything about heavy industry. And tells you everything about being late on the brakes. Now that it is starting to rain, we have to use our wipers.
So here, the blast furnace and the two copper stoves. Apparently those thing thingies work more or less in the way that you throw the coal and the ore in with those conveyor belts and then you blast hot air in from below and by falling through this hot air blast the ore and the coal gets turned into pig iron or crude iron that you can make steel out of no I did not want to get up I forgot to move my gearbox to the neutral setting that might be is a nice spot to look at the presentation that I wanted to look at today. I already warned you that I wanted to talk about transmissions and transmissions especially on the diesel engines, all the locomotives and DMUs, multiple units that run with a diesel engine and why we need a transmission there. Um, I can't go into the technical details, I can't tell you how exactly they are built, but what I can do to tell you is or discuss with you is the logical concept that is uh, yeah, connected with that and what we can learn from it for driving our trains. The uh, one thing that you find on every diesel locomotive or DMU is the diesel engine. That is the prime mover. This is where you create the power to propel your vehicle. And the diesel engine works more or less in the way you put diesel fuel in it and uh, then the diesel fuel gets ignited and in a cylinder in the cylinder a piston is driven and the pistons drive a shaft you can control how fast and how powerful the shaft is turning with a throttle and the throttle just allows more or less uh, fuel being sent to the diesel engine then you have a shaft that is rotating. And also on the other hand, you have your wheels and you want your wheels to rotate. And you need to connect those two things, your prime mover and the wheels. And this is where you need a transmission. And at the same time, you don't, you, not only do you need to uh, transport the turning force of the diesel engine to your wheels, you also have to solve what I always say is the basic problem with every wheeled vehicle that in the beginning when you want to start your vehicle, you need a lot of turning force, torque, but can do with um, a low turning speed, with a no, low number of rotations per minute. Always have in mind the bicycle with the gears stuck. At the beginning, you need a lot of force to turn the pedals around even once or half a rotation. You have to put all your weight on it and when you're running faster, then you can do with uh, less and less force to turn it around, but you want to turn around them and you want to turn the wheels faster and faster so that you can get to a higher speed. But the torque that you need for turning it around once is uh, very low. And this is the same with a vehicle for pulling trains, a locomotive or the DMU. So you have to uh, control the power that is coming from your diesel engine uh, so that you have a lot of torque at the beginning and can do with low rotations and in the end you need uh, high rotations and can do with less torque and uh, with the throttle you can control your diesel engine in the way that uh, the ratio of torque and rotations is more or less the same it turns faster with more force the more uh, the more uh, fuel you're putting in it but if you just put the same rotation to the wheels it will not work because you need much more torque in the beginning uh, for breaking free for for setting this whole thing in motion in german they have the nice word of losbrechen breaking loose and as soon as that had happened 
then it gets much easier so that you can lower the torque and uh, focus on getting it turning faster. And this is what the transmission has to do. Um, most vehicles that we have in the game deal with a diesel electric transmission that as well the the old diesel electric locomotives that we have on sand patch grade up to the more modern Trax 2 uh, locomotives no Trax 2 are just simply electric but also the uh, there are some versions that also have a diesel engine or have two systems but in the game they are only electric but the modern diesel uh, electric locomotives they always have the same principle still you use your diesel engine to turn the shaft and the shaft is turning a generator or an alternator depending on whether you want direct current or alternating current and then you lose you use electric wires to get your electric energy to a traction motor and the traction motor is converting the energy back into mechanical uh, uh, power to turn the wheels. And obviously there are many, many, many different variations of that principle. Um, but the general uh, principle always stays the same. The mechanical power produced by the diesel engine is used to produce an electric current and the electric current is then used to uh, feed a traction motor and the traction motor converts it back into mechanical energy to the wheels that is the diesel electric transmission it is very nice because the electric wiring you can put it wherever you want to uh, unlike a shaft that is always facing in the wrong direction you can just bend it around everything so that is that that is most probably because it, it is um, yeah the 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 transmission of choice in most modern vehicles that really need to go fast and uh, over the time they develop they develop more and more complex uh, methods to control how the traction motors are uh, applying torque and how fast they are rotating we have seen that on the f7 the even the f7 in um, the clinchfield railroad for example where you have those transitions where you go from serial to parallel and everything to uh, do this torque and rotation per minute balancing but uh, on modern machines you don't do that anymore you have electronically controlled traction motors that uh, do that for you but the general principle is the same what we have on more vehicles than you think at the beginning is a diesel hydraulic uh, transmission where you use an hydrostatic or an hydrokinetic transmission typically an hydrokinetic one there are a few shunting locomotives that use an hydrostatic transmission but most that you have and i think all the diesel hydraulics that are in the game are hydrokinetic transmissions where you use fluid couplings or torque converters that are all based on the fitting a principle where you use the force of streaming liquid typically oil here to um, to transport the turning force uh, of the diesel engine to the wheels so you convert the turning shaft from the diesel engine into flowing liquid and the flowing liquid then back into uh, turning the turning wheels we will have a look at this a bit more thoroughly in a different video i think because it is a really fascinating technology obviously i cannot explain all the details or any details at all but um, just to know about this technology helps a lot when uh, using trains of that kind last week we had an we had a locomotive with a hydrokinetic transmission, the old V60, the Deutsche Bahn Baureihe 565. And um, yeah, there is the G6, a very modern locomotive that also uses that. The new release of last week uh, from, um, what was it again, Skyhook, the Midland 
DLC has the one the class 158 a diesel multiple unit that has an hydrokinetic transmission uh, also the western the Baureihe, the Baureihe, the British class 5 uh, 52 the 52 the western has a diesel hydraulic transmission in Germany the the tilting train the 612 has diesel hydraulic transmission so there are a lot of vehicles that are actually using it and i think we will have a look at this in a different video in depth what we are talking about today is diesel mechanical though so it's the most basic transmission if you want because you're using the mechanical energy that the diesel engine is producing and transfer it to the wheels again in mechanical uh, energy by a mechanical transmission and that works typically with gears and pistons and rods and, and all that stuff that you maybe as a child would imagine as a machine yeah and typically you have some sort of a gear selector here if it is because typically all those mechanical transmissions need gears and, and different ratios to do the balancing between a torque and rotations per minute this is why on this train where we have a diesel mechanical transmission um, there is a gear selector if you think back to last week with the v60 for example uh, we talked about the fact that there on this locomotive uh, hydrokinetic transmission was uh, combined with a mechanical transmission afterwards there was one gear selector two gears that could be selected uh, for long range and for shunting so after one transmission there can obviously be a second one to uh, further uh, balance the torque and uh, speed that comes out of your diesel engine until it is delivered to the wheels so what i don't want to talk about is a diesel steam transmission and diesel pneumatic transmissions uh, you can find information about that that it had been used uh, in the past but i don't think that there are actually any vehicles existing as soon as we got them in the game we will talk about those funny ideas it's more or less ideas how to use your old steam engines with a with a diesel uh, prime mover but that is not a thing anymore the train that we are talking about today just to put that here so that we never forget that in the beginning for slow speed we need high torque low rotations in the other phases when we are going faster we can do with lower torque and need high rotations per minute and in the class 101 we have obviously our diesel engine we control it with our throttle that is the lever on the left we have a turning shaft coming out of it if you look under it in the model you can actually see a shaft uh, turning underneath the vehicle and this power is transported to the axles and on the axles there are uh, the wheels that are connected uh, with the axles so if the axles are turning the wheels are turning as well and in between we have our mechanical transmission and the mechanical trans transmission we control with the gear selector and obviously with the reverser as well those two things that uh, switch around our mechanical transmission but what is actually in our gearbox and on the class 101 we have um, a gearbox that is an epi cyclic transmission what does this mean an epi cyclic gear train is typically um, a mechanical device where you have one gear in the middle that is called the sun gear that's why i painted it uh, yellow and around the sun you have smaller cogs that are rotating around the sun gear in the middle and they are typically connected with a carrier so that they are rotating around the sun in a coordinated fashion and they are called the planet gears so if you are for example connect the diesel engine with the sun gear and the axles with the planet gears then you can have uh, one ratio of uh, of a transmission where you can depending on how 
big those cogs are, you can have them rotate and turn slower or faster. And um, to be able to switch gears, those units are typically uh, built in a way that there is a third gear, a gear that has all the teeth pointing to the middle. So in my uh, model here, they don't really mesh, but in, in reality, they would mesh. And then you have three connected gears, more or less, that all turn around the same axle. And this is an epicyclic gearing or a planetary gear train. Um, and what can you do with it? The thing is, if you just if you if you stop one of those three gears, you can control how fast uh, or yeah, with what force and with what velocity the other gears are returning. So if you're, for example, uh, driving the sun gear and connect the planet gears with your wheels, you can stop the red one, the angulus or the ring gear, and then you can influence the speed with what the other gears can turn or need to turn or whatever. And um, on this principle, one is kept, one is held. The other two are the input and the output. You can build gearboxes. So if you look at it from the side, this thing is like a drum. It is sitting on a shaft and in the middle there is the smaller sun gear and around the planet gears that are connected with the carrier. And the general idea is one is the input, like the sun gear, for example. One is the output, like the planet gears. And the other one is stopped at a certain point to make sure that now the transmission that sits in the ratio between those two cogs is activated. So if you look at our gearbox again, we will find that on the class 101, we have three of those units, so three drums with three sets of these gears and then they are connected with another thing that is a free will. We will get to this after we talked about the three drums and that is connected with the axles and the wheels. And how does the switching progress or uh, process uh, work now? If you're running the train in first gear, then there will be an installation that is like a, a clasp that stops the first drum and holds it in place. And then the gearing that comes out of the ratio between the sun gear and the planet gears that is in the first drum will be activated, more or less, and will be uh, responsible to control the relation between how fast and with what uh, torque the shaft is turning here to the speed and the force that the output shaft is turning. So you can, in first gear, have high torque, low rotations, even if the diesel engine is running uh, with the same speed and with the same power output. When you're switching to second gear, what happens then? The clasp on the first drum will release and a clasp on the second drum will activate and hold the annulus of the second drum in place. And then the gear ratio that is in the, the sun gears and planet gears in the second drum is activated. And you have a different ratio between torque and velocity. And this process, letting go of one drum and holding fast the next drum, is what takes the time and why we need to wait a bit until we throttle up again after changing gears. So like one second, two second, and then you can throttle up again. If you throttle up too fast, then you will hit this point, for example, when no drum is held in place and then you are throttled into neutral. And then we, we will just have the engine revving high, destroying maybe the gearbox and don't get any power to the wheels. So you always have to wait for the clasp to fix. Third gear is the same uh, principle. The second drum is released and the third uh, drum is held and then the ratio that sits into the third drum will be responsible for converting the uh, torque and rotation from the coming from the diesel engine, delivering it to the wheels. And then where's our fourth, fourth drum for the fourth gear? 
there is none. Why not? Because at this point, all the three drums are connected together. And then uh, the ratio is one to one. What you send into the gearbox comes out on the other end. So you're running through the gearbox and uh, have the highest... Uh, well, well, you don't, you don't uh, reduce the rotation speed at this point anymore to get higher torque. What is now this freewheel that we have here in the end? This is what allows you to coast with a gear in place. So what we have been talking about is that you always have to coast in fourth gear. And uh, so that you can do that with the engine only idling when you're coasting uh, is this freewheel. This allows the axles and wheels actually to run uh, faster than the shaft coming from the diesel engine is coming. So if the axles and wheels are running faster than the shaft coming from the gearbox and from the diesel engine, this freewheel allows that to happen. Only if it is the other way around, the diesel engine is turning harder and faster than the axles and wheels, then it grips again and drives them again. But so we can coast in fourth gear. I'm not exactly sure where this freewheel is, if it is here between the gearbox and the axles or whether it is somewhere in the bogies. Uh, I couldn't find out where it exactly is, but that is the idea about the freewheel. So if you uh, want to coast, you set your throttle to uh, idle, then the engine is only idling, the shaft is only uh, turning very slowly and the gearbox stays in fourth gear because then all the drums are connected and this prevents all the little cocks in the gearbox to rotate because otherwise the more rotation, the more work is going on in the gearbox with the cocks, then uh, the more wear and wear and tear will happen and it will uh, just run down your gearbox faster. This is why you're always supposed to run in fourth gear. Uh, as soon as you're getting to the station then and are really slow, then you are supposed to set your gearbox to idle and uh, uh, to neutral. And then in neutral, this will be uh, removed and then nothing is held in place and then you are just running into the uh, open gearbox and no uh, power is transferred to the axles and wheels and this only should happen if you are running very slowly otherwise you will uh, wear and tear down your gearbox so this is what I wanted to talk about today. I found this an interesting uh, fact. I, I read on the description of this train that is an epicyclical transmission, and I wanted, I just wanted to know what that is and uh, what we can use of all this for driving the train is to know when to switch and when we have to wait so that we can make the best out of our. Uh, transmission. Back to our train. Rain is coming down heavily. Sitting here in red car British steel. As CD Radar said, the least used station in the United Kingdom can maybe try to find the spot where we can see the rotating shaft yeah here for example you can see it rotating in idling speed there is a flywheel obviously attached to it <laughs> yeah maybe not today but on some point So, first gear, full throttle, until the rotation gets to the up, then throttle down, gear up, 
wait a bit until the second drum is held and then throttle up again. Throttle down, shift, throttle up again. The ro from what I have found, if you manage to throttle up, as soon as the hand here is below this little marker, then you're good. And then you can see here in the diagram, those jerks are always the face where you switched gears. There are two engines in this train set. If you want to check if both engines are running more or less at the same speed, you can use this switch here. And then you can switch between the readings for the two engines. Those structures that are looming out of the fog to the right all belong to the steel industry. That is still in full bloom in 1985. Many of those structures that look like little boxes with a funnel on top where conveyor belts are leading to they are often coke ovens where you can produce coke from coal I think we need to slow down to 55 around here In this fog you don't really see a lot. Yeah, we managed. We have to stop at South Bank. That means we are not stopping at Grangetown. That is just past this bridge here. But there is a limit to 35 somewhere past the station. And with those old British DLCs, it's always root knowledge. And was my root knowledge good or was it not? No, it wasn't. <laughs> there is no... the reduction comes later. So I'm actually a bit too slow. I applied the brakes too early. Chili, it's okay. We're having a thunderstorm in real life as well as in the game. And my dog is always scared of th thunderstorms. Last, last time she broke the cable that connects the screen with the, with the computer. I hope we can keep her from doing this today. Switching to neutral.
Oh dear. Yeah, in the gloom you can see all the conveyor belts and all the installations for making steel. Another train set is coming from the other direction. The door control is only in the game, in real life those were slam door trains so the doors were opened and closed by the passengers assisted by a guard. Well at least we managed to stay on the timetable. Right, now we're going to Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. Bone. Without a second O. I missed the point for switching. That's better. So now you can see we have to prepare for the reduction in speed uh, in speed limit that is incoming. Can try to get as far as possible to the 60 miles so that we don't lose too much time now with this station approaching you can already throttle down Now here's another 60. Now we're going around this bend. And I like to start applying brakes here at the latest. Because the 35 reduction will be here. I hope. This 15 is just for the crossover, not for us. But there should be a modern 35 sign. On the left. Now. Let's hope I... Am right this time. Now I am right. Here it is. 35 miles. Now we should be going to the right. Across the Changchun. There is a further reduction to 25. Like now.
Now I have actually a hard time distinguishing whether the lightning strikes are in the game or in the real life. Thank you for taking care of the dogs. Okay. That was a messed up stop. And this is why they don't allow to have dogs in the cab. Because if dogs are crawling around your feet while trying to run a train, this does not work out well. <laughs> so there are actually people getting on the train here, Middleborough. Let's see if we can catch a glimpse of what is happening here. Thunderstorm, that is hap what, ha what is happening. The River Tees, for, uh, by the way, that is the namesake for this DLC, is always to our right. We don't really see it a lot. We will be crossing it soon. But actually a lot of the very nice structures here in the game you don't see them so easily from uh, from the route. So <laughs> those dogs are really distracting. Yeah, we are still in the 25 speed limit. And I am speeding. My screens are shaking because the dogs are running against it. We should have switched to gear number 4 when coasting here. Now back to second gear to accelerate to the 45 that are allowed from this point. Oh. Yeah, the dog would be great for keeping dead man pedal breast. <laughs> At the moment, they are giving us a hard time here. There's a uh, 37 coming from the other direction. So I have to apologize. This is a bit chaotic at the moment. With the dogs running everywhere. I want to direct your attention to the right. There is a very interesting bridge, Newport Bridge I think it is. And it is animated in the game, so it is a bridge that can be lowered and raised so that ships can pass underneath. Oops. Now everything passed underneath the track here. Now it is lowered so that cars can pass, but it can be raised so where are we now so that ships can pass so in the game the thunderstorm is over I hope the thunderstorm in real life will be over soon so, so 
no it's not it's still <laughs> going on heavily so here we go back to 60 and we can accelerate to 60 but not for too long as, lo as soon as we have passed this yard on the side we have to slow down to 50 again uh, since you're talking about the dead man pedal here we have a dead man switch I think it is incorporated in the throttle lev lever so you have to press the throttle lever down so that the train does not go into a penalty break but it is not simulated in the game so we are on the left ended we can prepare for the reduction in speed limit to 50 like about here it should appear out of or did we already pass it well whatever now we are already in the 50 limit and at the end of this curve we need to be down to 35 and that's stop at Thornaby there is this empty house it looks, looks, looks a bit like it has been burned down at some point in time. Stop at Thornaby is one of the stops that are uphill. So the gradient should help here with getting the train to a stop. neutral and still I am too fast I can't help I am too fast today wanna be I think to the right there there is the Stockton area one of the towns that gave its name to the very old Darlington Stockton railway what was when I have read this correctly one of the oldest commercial railroads in Great Britain so in many many ways this is historic ground that we are running on I hope the dogs have calmed down now. Typically the guard would bus you something like to depart and then you would confirm by bussing it back. then you can actually leave. Here you need to be careful so the train does not roll backwards when you start. So apply some throttle before the brakes have completely released. Still in a 35 limit.
But soon we will get to a point where the limit increases to 45. And then we will be actually... We will cross the Tees River here at this point. This is the only spot in the route, more or less. Where you can see the Tees River. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Our thunderstorm here is still, still, still going on. Okay, I have to stop for a second. And back. The dogs are in the bathroom now. Where they should have more peace. And AJ is with them, so don't worry, they will be they will be fine. Oh, TD Radar is posting a link to a cab view of the Prague Metro. I will gladly watch that. And also with the cab views from different types of train in the Czech Republic and you can change the view in real time from cab to bogey. Also, there are timestamps for every track signal. Oh, oh, that is great. That is great. I will gladly watch this. Right after the stream. And after I have sorted out the dogs. So, I think we don't need our wipers anymore. We can prepare for our stop at Eagle's Cliff. Well, I apologize, this is a bit of a confused stream today. But with the dogs between my feet and crawling behind the screens and threatening to topple over everything. It is hard to stay focused. You should have done this. There is a a class 20, a chopper, on the other platform. You should have done this with a, with a train that is easier to drive. There you can take your dogs along, even on a thunderstorm.
that is about the stop that I always tried to do. With the dogs in the bathroom. It suddenly works. At least once yet. <laughs> Well, really kudos to, to those drivers to stop those trains always at the correct spot. Now we're going to the right on this switch. This is why the 30 applies to us. They do not need to stop at that much of a precise spot. I take your word for that. So, limit is going up to 45, but we have to stop at Allen's West. I think in real life he would not accelerate here anymore, but to stay on the timetable and to make the fastest out of it, you need to. They can stop at wherever they want at the platform. Yeah, I guess that's right. But I want to stop at the 500 point stop. <laughs> In a way that uh, as little as possible passengers will fall out of their seats. This is actually something that I would have on my wish list for the game. That you can see well, how jerky your uh, accelerating and braking actually is. Because I guess as a real train driver you can feel that and you can feel what braking and accelerating is unacceptable for passengers. But in the game you can't really feel it. There is an accelerometer in the HUD. I have heard about that, yeah, that's true. But I've never, never uh, looked at it, to be honest. But it, it would be great if you could see, like, a line here, like your speed line, and, and, and see if you have, like, uh, peaks of acceleration or braking. And then you came aim for not to stop harder than 12G or what? <laughs> At least this is the timetable that you can actually manage to stay on.
So, last stop is already Dinsdale. We won't be stopping at the airport. For a so short uh, length of track, we have a 60 limit, but it will go down to 50 again. So we will probably not be able to get to the 60. Before the install there will be another junction, now we go back to 60. So as soon as the whole train has passed the sign, we can accelerate to 60. Before the install there will be a junction and we are going to the left, that means we have to slow down to 30 at this point. But before that we can accelerate to full line speed of 60 here. What is the fastest, I think, here in this DLC? And now we are out of the steel area and away from the river. Just in rural North Yorkshire. With animals on the pastures. After having reached your speed, you can just throttle down to 2 or something to keep it at that. Changing between 2 or 3 if you need to get closer to the limit and then back to 2. So when are we going across the junction? There was something like a marker for me, but first we are passing the airport. This is the airport, the airfield. You can see some airplanes actually. But it looks quite deserted. There's an airplane in the air. I don't know if that was what the airport station looked like in the 1980s but it looks a bit small for an airport station Yeah, I don't know how you think about it, but I, I really enjoy this train. This is quality work from the early days of Train Sim World. Well, the early days. It's a Train Sim World 2 era DLC, I think. But still. Ooh. I missed my junction. That was obviously much too fast around this corner.
So please don't judge me for my driving today. I actually practiced driving this train on three or four services across the week to be able to do it, but that was a bit not for the cat as the Germans say or for the dogs and the thunderstorm Well, at least there were two stops of the kind that I would like to stop every time. Not this one, but uh, two in Eagles Cliff and Alien West. Let's see what we can do on the last one. Well, maybe not the busiest airport. Well, from what you can read on the internet, it is at least nowadays a quite busy airport. Run. Good thing these old trains do not have any record of speed that will betray us. Yep. Otherwise, I would have lost my job for the umpteenth time. And good thing in. 1985 there are no people on the train with uh, smartphones checking if you're actually sticking to the speed limit and calling the complaints line if you don't Well, uh, let's get this baby home. <laughs> Is that so? I guess this must be so annoying really. Nobody's complained about you so far. That is the good to hear. So we are getting a lot of rain today in real life as well as in the game. But that happens if you switch your date to the more or less current date. So there will be a reduction to 35 before we get to the junction. I hope now I won't miss my markers. If I am not wrong then there are two bridges in short succession then there is a line coming in from the right and then there is another bridge and after the bridge you can go until the signal and at the signal you should slow down let's hope my root knowledge does not deceive me here I think the company resolved some complaints 
with a one-size-fits-all response without the driver even knowing anything has come up. But don't tell them. <laughs> yeah, probably. Line coming in. At least in so far my recollection was correct. Now there is one bridge alone and after that there should be one more signal. That's the signal for the opposite direction. And then there should be a signal for us too. That's the AWS and there is the signal. And then 10 inches of mercury and we should hit the 35 at the sign. Let's hope if that works out, or if with all the rain it doesn't. Soon as the bend starts to the right, there should be the sign for the 35. Yes. This works, at least. Where the two lines converge, there is a reduction to 30. So slow. That is root knowledge, right? If I get... If I try, if I make an effort, then I can actually do it. Alright, and now there is the 30, I guess. Yeah, here's the 30. Only for traversing this this line. This is the line that goes on to Newcastle, I think. Newcastle upon Tyne. And as soon as we are through, we can actually, if we want, accelerate again. when going into the station because it's a 35 limit here I don't think anyone would do that in real life, right? unless they are really late AWS because we got a caution signal Darlington Station. All right. That was the AWS for the red. The stops need to be practiced a lot more. But anyway, we made it in one piece to the end of the route. Two stops were of the kind that I would sign them, actually. We had a lot of rain, we had a lot of thunderstorms in real life as well. I apologize again for the confusion with the dogs. And uh, thank you for staying with me. Thank you for uh, support. And thanks for the two links, CD Raider. I will check them out as soon as I checked on the dogs. If anything, you know where to find me. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I actually will come back to you. Uh, I don't know how fast, but I will. And thanks for, for uh, the support through all the streams and the videos. It's really great to have you on the stream. Well, I think... 
yeah where actually did all the loading p pictures the loading screen pictures uh, vanish to in the game did only i lose them or are they no longer a thing well anyway thanks for today um take care and have a nice week